Welcome to the Psychology Talk podcast. We are your hosts, Dr. Scott Hoy, clinical psychologist, and Kyle Miller, licensed counselor. Psychology Talk is a unique conversation about psychology around the globe. We speak with psychology experts to keep you informed about current issues and trends. We advocate toward reducing stigma and educate about mental health. While you're listening, Please take a moment to give us a review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, or your favorite streaming service. It helps us to continue providing you with quality programming. And now, enjoy the episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Psychology Talk podcast. Today, I am joined by Dr. Stephen Taylor. Dr. Taylor is a senior lecturer in psychology at Leeds Beckett University and the author of several best-selling books on psychology and spirituality. He's the current chair of the Transpersonal Psychology section of the British Psychological Society. His 13 books include Waking from Sleep, The Fall, Out of the Darkness, Back to Sanity, The Calm Center, The Leap, Spiritual Science, and The Clear Light, which features a foreword by Eckhart Tolle. Dr. Taylor is here to discuss, in part, his latest book, Extraordinary Awakenings, When Trauma Leads to Transformation. Dr. Taylor, uh, hearty welcome to the show. Hi, Scott. Great to be with you. Yeah, Thank you so much for taking time out here. Well, what can you uh, read your book? Fascinating stuff. Nice uh, reframe on traumatic experiences and and the growth that can come out of them. But maybe you can kind of um, lead lead us with a discussion of what's in that book and some of those amazing concepts. It's uh, it's a summary of the research I've been doing over the last few years into um, a phenomenon which I call transformation through turmoil, or TTT, which is um, a a very dramatic uh, form of post-traumatic growth. So I, I've interviewed a lot of um, people who've been through incredibly traumatic circumstances, such as um, prisoners who've been incarcerated for a long time, mm-hmm. soldiers, um, bereaved people, addicts, and so on. And what these people have in common is that they've all gone through this radical transformation deep in the midst of their suffering, usually at the point where they were completely broken down. They felt they were close to death and they felt there was no hope. They hit kind of classic rock bottom. And that's usually when the transformation occurred. This a, a radical shift in identity. Mm-hmm. Okay, and um, it, well, it's, it's a little bit different than post traumatic growth, right? It's something a bit beyond that. Yeah, it's similar, but it's much more dramatic. Uh, post traumatic growth is usually very gradual, uh, whereas uh, TTT is usually very sudden. And it, you know, it's such a dramatic transformation that people often feel that they are a different person living in the same body. And it's a spiritual awakening, really. You know, you could use that. You can use that term. It's uh, a shift into a higher functioning, spiritually spiritually awakened state, mm-hmm. in which people feel incredibly connected to the world around them, to other people. They feel connected to a deeper identity within them, within themselves. They have a tremendous sense of gratitude uh, and a, a new sense of meaning and purpose. And a lot of them don't have a background in spirituality, so they don't really understand what's happened to them. So some people are initially quite confused. Right. It must, but, be, um, yeah, it must be kind of like uh, when Stanislav Grav uh, talks about spiritual uh, uh, emergencies, right? When people don't know that it can, they're having this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it can be similar. Yeah, I mean, particularly when the transformation is very explosive, uh, which it sometimes is, you know, then it can cause psychological disturbances, which are sometimes confused with psychosis. Mm-hmm. In, a, in quite a few cases, people, you know, because they didn't have a background in spirituality, they didn't really know what had happened. So they thought, have I gone a bit crazy? Even though they felt more sane than normal, they didn't really have a language to explain it. So they thought, maybe I've gone crazy. And one guy actually found a, a textbook of psychiatric disorders and was looking through the book trying to find his own disorder. But then he realized, hey, I'm not in the book. So, <laughs> so maybe I'm not crazy after all. And then he realized that you know something positive had happened to him, not something negative. So, 
uh, it, you're, the book is filled with all sorts of stories. So it's a very phenomenological uh, aspect to the research, which is refreshing since a lot of people doing trauma work these days are so excited about neurotransmitters and parts of the brain. But you really don't go into that. You're really thinking about like the actual personal lived experience of, of what it's like to have this kind of transformation. Yeah, I mean, I sometimes refer, I sometimes refer to that as neuromania, this kind of desire to <laughs> yeah, take everything yeah. back to the brain. Yeah, you know, I'm sure these these uh, experiences do have some sort of neurological correlations, but it's very difficult to find them. And in, in a sense, I don't think they're that important. What is really important is the experience that people go through. Uh, you know, the way that their vision of the world transforms and the way that their behavior transforms. I'm not really interested in the way that their neurological functioning transforms. Right, right, right. Well, because the, the lived experience isn't a neurotransmitter. It's maybe the flip side of a neurotransmitter. Yeah, right? Yeah, it's like... Yeah, yeah. And, and nobody really knows how neurological functioning relates to experience or conscious, called consciousness. It's a big question, you know, the hard problem of, you know, translating neurological activity into consciousness. There's no sort of, you know, explanation really. Even, even um, you know, fairly, fairly well-known... Um, mental phenomena like depression, for example, nobody really knows how depression links to the brain, you know, which parts of the brain are involved in depression. It's all really open to the, open to the question. And it's, it's not really a fruitful line of inquiry, in my view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and that's what makes the uh, book refreshing and your perspective uh, very refreshing in, in trauma work. Also, you're looking towards this kind of spiritual awakening that happens post-trauma, uh, which many people don't look at that. They just want to make the symptoms subside, get everybody patched up. Uh, that's not fair, of course. Uh, I think a lot of clinicians are a lot more open to spirituality than they might you know, mm. advertise. But uh, there's this idea of like how uh, these life experiences can actually lead to a greater sense of self right, and in connection to the world. Yeah, it's not just a question of coping, you know, or l learning to deal with symptoms. It's a question of like switching into a completely different identity, you know, a radically different identity, which experiences the world in a different way. I think one of the most basic transformations is, um, you know, we mentioned the word connection. I think you know, it, normal human experience is includes a sense of separation. There's a basic sense of duality between human beings and the world in our normal state. We feel that we live in our, our own mental space and the rest of the world is somewhere out there. And that, that basic sense of duality creates a, a sense of anxiety, a basic sense of isolation, which I think is at the root of a lot of human behavior, a lot of kind of pathological human behavior. But in these experiences, people transcend that sense of separation and they become part of the world. They regain, you know, the, the kind of sense of participation which young children have you know young children don't really separate themselves from the world mm -hmm. it's not a question of going back to that state but it's a question of recapturing some of that sense of participation and the joy of belonging to the world yeah yeah well um maybe we can kind of backtrack a bit for those listening in and maybe we can talk about what these traumas are you're describing because i know there's a number of uh, you're talking about transformations and you're talking about trauma, not just in like war trauma or complex trauma per se. But I know you mentioned like prisoners, people, people in isolation, people with depression, stress, uh, anxiety, like high levels of anxiety, suicidality, <laughs> right? Or attempts. Uh, maybe you can take one story as an example. Uh, from that, if you'd like to, to kind of explain some of these concepts uh, with examples. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, one good example is uh, a Scottish lady called Eve, who's now in her mid 40s or late 40s. And she was uh, an alcoholic. Well, she was a severe alcoholic for 29 years from a very young age. I think she started to drink at the age of nine or 10 and continued for many years. And like a lot of addicts, she underwent a, a gradual process of loss. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she functioned for a certain amount of time, but slowly towards the end of her, uh, the period of her addiction, things began to fall away. You know, friends lost trust in her. She broke contact with her family. And she ended up living on the streets, sleeping rough. And um, she'd completely given up hope. She was like surviving by shoplifting and just drinking. She said she was drinking nine or ten bottles of wine a day. Wow. 
And it, it got to the point where she was just uh, dealing with the symptoms. If she didn't drink for half an hour, she'd get the shakes, the DTs. She'd get hallucinations. She'd be filled with this tremendous sense of panic. So she was just drinking to sort of stave off the symptoms. And she she couldn't, you know, she tried to stop before. She'd never been able to. So she gave up hope and she didn't think she had any prospects of stopping drinking. So she decided to attempt suicide. And um, she knew that at a certain point there was a coach that would pass on the way to Glasgow. So she decided to wait for the coach and she stepped in front of it when she saw it coming. But luckily the driver swerved and she survived the suicide attempt. And the police came, the police took her back to her parents' house, and her parents assumed that she, they would have to give her a drink because she was an alcoholic. And her mother gave her a glass of wine, but she couldn't drink it. She picked it up, put it down again, picked it up, put it down again. She just couldn't drink it for some reason. Then she looked at herself in the mirror and didn't recognize herself. She thought, who is that person? I just don't associate myself with that reflection. So it's a very strange phenomenon. And then the doctor gave her some sedatives to deal with to deal with the withdrawal symptoms, some heavy sedatives. Mm -hmm. And when she came round, when she came to from the sedatives, she felt like she was different, a different person. And the urge to drink, remarkably, had just disappeared. So for for twenty nine years, the main object of her life had been to drink, and that had been on constantly on her mind. But for some reason, it had just fallen away, and she didn't understand why. And she also felt this tremendous sense of connection this sense that the world around her had somehow come to life and was more real nature was more beautiful uh, everything looked fascinating and interesting and she felt this new sense of trust in herself this sense that she was somehow you know she'd become somehow a deeper and more authentic person and so it was a very miraculous and mysterious transformation which she didn't understand and then she went to she started to go to aa meetings and one of them said, one of the guys at AA said, you've, you sound like you've undergone a spiritual awakening. She thought, you know, what does that mean? What is a spiritual awakening? But when she looked into it, she realized it was, it was true. And also, one of the guys at AA said, oh, you're just on a pink cloud. This will fade away after a while. But it never faded away. You know, 10 years later now, she's still remained in this heightened, spiritually awakened state. And the urge to drink has never returned. She's, she's been sober for, for all of that time now. What? Maybe you can go into a little bit more detail about that state. I mean, you mentioned like colors and nature being more real. Like, uh, does, she, does she, so the audience can kind of get a sense of that? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people have, um, I call them awakening experiences in a temporary sense. You know, you could be walking in the countryside and suddenly you're struck by the unusual beauty of the things around you. Suddenly you feel a sense of connection to your surroundings. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you feel a sense of harmony inside yourself. All your problems seem to fade away. So I think that sometimes happens maybe after a sexual experience, maybe after a meditation. Mm -hmm. It can happen mm -hmm. when you're running or swimming. But you, we, we often, oh, at least we sometimes have these temporary awakening experiences when we shift into a heightened state of awareness. Mm -hmm. But they can become permanent. And I think it, in the cases I discussed in the book, this heightened state becomes permanent. It becomes an ongoing um, experience of, of life. And it is, and you, you could explain it in terms of uh, an expansion of awareness in lots of different areas. There's an expansion of awareness in terms of perception, so the world becomes more real and beautiful. There's an expansion of awareness in terms of connection to other people, so you have more empathy, more compassion for other people. There's an expansion of awareness in terms of your own subjective experience, because you become somehow a deeper and more, more authentic person. Mm -hmm. And also in, in terms of even in conceptual terms, there's this sense of there's a new kind of universal or global outlook. You know, you're no longer caught in a kind of limited group identity. You're no longer caught in this egoic bubble of your own desires and ambitions. You have a much wider uh, world centric percep per perception of things. Okay. And, and so it kind of, it, the description of this is kind of, circumvents the idea of like struggling with this trouble in, in psychotherapy or behavior approaches. And uh, this kind of switch that's flipped changes everything almost immediately. It does. Yeah. It, it, it is such a radical transformation. And that's why, you know, even though people do feel this new sense of exhilaration and connection and well-being. It's sometimes overlaid with a sense of confusion because people, you know, they don't really understand what's happened to them unless they have a background in spirituality. 
then they think, ah, oh, yeah, I've had, I've had a spiritual awakening. But and occasionally, as we said before, if it's quite explosive, it can have like it can have sort of disturbing or disruptive symptoms. Mm-hmm. So that can add to the problematic issues too. So, you know, it, it can be a problematic uh, experience as well. Uh, now, I, I know you're a researcher and, and, um, and a professor uh, and a lecturer. I'm, I'm wondering if you do clinical work these days and if you've uh, worked with people to pro- you know, provide them with proper uh, clinical experiences to kind of integrate this this transformation and what that might look like. I don't do clinical work now, but uh, but I, I do sort of suggest guidelines that people should follow. I often do is kind of informal. I give people advice informally. People mm-hmm. often write to me to say, you know, I've had this kind of awakening experience and I feel kind of unsettled and a little bit confused. And how can I ground myself? How can I, how can I settle myself down? Mm-hmm. So I sometimes give people some, you know, some general advice uh, which is usually um, spend a lot of time in nature because mm-hmm. nature has a kind of healing and stilling effect. Mm-hmm. Also, give yourself lots of uh, quiet time. Stay away from stress and overactivity and overstimulation. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a question of healing, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so you need, you know, you could use the analogy of an earthquake. It's like an earthquake within your being. And it takes a long time. So an earthquake in very, very slow motion, it takes a long time for the ground to settle again and for, you know, some form, the structures to reestablish themselves. But it's a natural process. It does happen in the long run. And if you give yourself, you know, time to heal, if you give yourself quiet time to integrate, then you can encourage the, the stabilizing process, the integration process. Mm-hmm. Well, you do mention some in the book, you do mention some some of those steps, right? Yeah, I, well, I uh, offer some advice about how to harness the transformational ba- uh, potential of crises and challenges. Mm-hmm. Because when we all go through trauma in our lives, we all go through suffering. You know, as the Buddha told us, life is full of suffering. So it's important to, you know, when suffering does occur, when crises do occur, it's important for us to to approach them in the in the right way, and particularly so that we can harness their transformational potential. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so uh, maybe you can outline a few of those those, those steps. See so how I'm <laughs> yeah. going. <laughs> I, knew we, I knew you were going to ask that. Uh, oh, you're psychic. I see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, the most important aspect is to approach challenges with an attitude of um, acknowledgement and acceptance. So many of us, particularly when major challenges occur in our lives, uh, such as if you're diagnosed with a serious illness, when you go through a bereavement, and so forth. Mm-hmm. A lot of us feel what I call the avoidance impulse mm-hmm. because the re- reality seems painful. We don't want to face it. So we avoid contemplating the reality of the predicament. Um, but unless you do give your full attention to the reality of the predicament and contemplate the reality of it, and unless you give your full awareness to the painful feelings that you experience, you, you, you need to go inside yourself as well, not to just divert yourself in external things. You have to go inside your own being, face up to the painful experiences, mm-hmm. observe your own thoughts and feelings in relation to the predicament. But most of all, you know, the, the final step in the process of harnessing the potential of the, the transformational potential of these events is an attitude of acceptance. So you have to completely open yourself to the predicament, let go of any resistance, any sense of duality or conflict between yourself and and reality, and just surrender to the situation. You know, and it, when people people often mention this, a lot of people I interviewed could pinpoint a specific moment when they surrendered or let go or accepted their predicament, and that was usually the moment when transformation occurred. So that shows how, how important an attitude of acceptance is. Okay. So acceptance is a, is a big part of that, <clears throat> which, uh, which is kind of a, uh, a Buddhist kind of idea, but also, um, yeah. but also just a good psychological flexibility. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. curious, like, have you, I know this is all phenomenological work you're doing, but are you, have you looked at any personality traits that, that people might have? I mean, obviously, 
it's kind of hard to to do a pre and post uh, TTT experience to, mm. to see if, to see what changes or what stays stable. But like, I'm, I'm curious. What, maybe just offhand, maybe you can kind of hypothesize what what might be a similar characteristic amongst all of these people. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a big puzzle because everybody goes through trauma, as we said before, but only a certain amount of people undergo transformation. So there are, there are certainly certain characteristics of people which facilitate this experience. I think to an extent, it's a question of whether, of whether a person is ready for the experience. A lot of people report feeling as if this uh, new identity was kind of in, was kind of dormant or latent inside them, waiting for the opportunity to emerge. It was kind of fully formed as a, as a structure. And it was just, you know, just biding its time, waiting for the normal ego to break down, and then it could emerge and become a person's new identity. Mm -hmm. But in other people, that maybe that latent higher self isn't ready to emerge. Maybe that's one factor. But things like uh, openness, you know, openness mm -hmm. to experience, that seems to be a big factor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people who have a strong sense of control over their lives, people who have more rigid identities, they, they seem to be less likely to undergo this transformation. Interestingly, in my research, it seems to be more common amongst women than men. Um, I don't want to draw any you know, real conclusions about that because maybe men are less willing to come forward about their experiences. But, but I mean, it kind of fits in a way that women generally, I would say, have a slightly more kind of open personality trait. Mm -hmm. And maybe that predisposes them to this kind of experience. So, it's like things like creativity as well. You know, people with more with softer ego boundaries tend to be more creative, more intuitive more open to spiritual experiences and maybe they're more open to this kind of transformational experience too. Okay. So less neuroticism, more openness and, um, and certainly yeah. openness kind of predicates creativity. Yeah. Or like, yeah. like, like the idea of like softer boundaries in the mind. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. A kind of a rigid sense of ego with strong boundaries is less likely to be open to this kind of experience. Yeah. I'm wondering, how did you get excited about this uh, this kind of research? How did you how did you find yourself doing this research? It probably was an organic process, I assume. To an extent, but it, it probably goes back to my own experiences as a teenager. As a teenager, I was really depressed, probably like a lot of teenagers. But for me, it lasted for quite a long time, for six or seven years, from the age of 16 into my early 20s. I was in a kind of intermittent state of deep depression, oh, you know, okay. a lot, quite a lot of suicidal ideation. And um, But every so often, in the midst of my depression, I'd have these euphoric experiences. I suddenly you know, felt as though, I was, as though I was taken out of myself, and the world around me became incredibly real and beautiful. I felt a sense of harmony inside myself and outside myself. But at the time, I didn't understand the experiences. I thought they were they were further proof that was that there was something wrong with me. You know that I was crazy. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but yeah. later on, I began to wonder if these experiences were somehow linked to my own depression. You know, if they were, they were, they seemed like a kind of flip side. You know, I'd just sort of flip over from depression into this uh, state of joy, as if you know the the boundary between depression and and ecstasy was very thin, as if they were just like two sides of the same coin. So I well, think that was what brought my brought me to this area. Let's go on. Were you going to say something else? Oh, only that. Um, you know, years later, when I became a psychologist, I really wanted to investigate, you know, the origins of these heightened experiences, awakening experiences, as, as I began to call them. And I found in my research that uh, psychological turmoil was one of the major triggers of awakening experiences. Yeah. I, I similar uh, experience when I was in my teens, I lost uh, my father and uh, my closest uh, sibling, my brother. And uh, it was a very heightened, heightened appreciation for nature and life, you know, I, I, from that experience. Uh, you know, I remember that summer, especially really diving into the English romantic poets and, and really enjoying nature and just, just, <laughs> just going out in nature and, and, and be, you know. Yeah, taking, yeah it's very taking, similar to, yeah. to my background, yeah. Right. I, I actually studied, originally I studied uh, English and American literature, oh, okay. partly because I loved uh, sort of romantic poetry. 
Yeah, it was a while later that I dug into the German romantics, but yeah, I think that's always like, it's like the the gateway drug is Byron and Wordsworth and Shelley, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, it's just, this is just such a, a rich field and the book itself to, to express the experience of reading the book for for someone who's a psychotherapist or somebody in men, mental health or or just interested in the human experience or someone who's going through these kind of transformational experiences and who doesn't to some extent uh what do you think this might do for the field of trauma uh research and treatment what well, is is that is that a vision you might have somewhere Yes. I mean, there hasn't been much research about this this type of experience. There's been a lot of research into post-traumatic growth, which has become a very well-researched psychological concept, which is great mm -hmm. because post-traumatic growth is very important. But this, this type of much more dramatic and extreme type of transformation hasn't really been researched in mainstream psychology. It's been touched on in transpersonal psychology you know, in, in terms of spiritual awakening. But, you know, the, the, the term spiritual, I'm sometimes a bit reluctant to use it because most people who have these experiences are not connected to spirituality. That They don't follow spiritual paths, paths or practices. They don't know anything about spirituality in most cases. <clears throat> and, and, the, and the experiences are not triggered by spiritual practices. So I'd, li I'd really like to take them out of the context of spirituality and treat them as a psychological phenomenon, which is what they essentially are. Yeah. And uh, I also think a lot of people have these experiences, but don't tell anybody about them because a lot of people don't really understand what's happened to them. And I'm, I'm constantly amazed at the number of people who write to me to say that they've had similar experiences. And they often say, oh, I didn't really understand what was happening in, until, you know, I read your book or this article. Um, so I have this I have this strong feeling that there are, you know, potentially thousands of awakened people transformed people walking amongst us who don't really understand what's happened and have not even talked to other people about it that's really that's a fascinating idea and it i i i would wholeheartedly agree right i mean life happens on its terms and what do you think is behind but what do you think is behind people like kind of being in the broom closet if you will or in the hmm. in the closet about their spirituality like what do you think is do you think that's a just a cultural look? Like the Western mind has been has been colonized by uh, uh, yeah. materialism and 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 Cartesian the Cartesians mind body split and all that. I think so. I think it's a product of uh, the physicalist or materialist paradigm, which dominates um, European and sort of North American culture. And a lot of people, particularly people who are involved in academia, who are interested in science, they to them these experiences are taboo, and they don't really, even if they have them, they don't really want to talk about them, because a lot of people associate them with with religion, you know, religion is seen as the the mortal enemy of science. <laughs> so I, I did a talk a couple of years ago, just before the lockdown. And I was talking about awakening experiences and giving some examples. And a woman came up to me at the end and said, I'm an atheist, but I've had this kind of experience. Is that possible? And I said, of course it's possible. You know, it's nothing to do with being an atheist. <laughs> or, you know, I said religious people may have these experiences and interpret them in religious, religious terms. But atheists can have them too and just interpret them in psychological terms. So a lot of people are just reluctant to own up to these experiences. And I think some people, some people actually repress them as well. They have them and sort of shift them to the back of their minds and mm -hmm. try to forget about them. Well, it, uh, it could be that the epistemology that we have, this kind of physicalist uh, epistemology, also just, you know, we, as Goethe said, we look for what we are seeking and we find it, right? You know, that's, that's you know, true. your assumptions uh, like uh, of the world are... Uh, uh, the perspective you take is going to uh, cause you to kind of see things in a certain way. Um, 
That's true. You mentioned the pandemic. I, I wonder if you've had any people reaching out to you because of these kind of experiences due to the pandemic. And is it, I mean, this is a global experience mm. Uh, uh, mm. And, a, and a kind of grieving of a sense of self. I'm getting this from a lot of my patients in practice and just talking to, to my friends and even myself. Is just, People have had a lot of time to go inwards and shift priorities. That's true. Yeah. I haven't had any reports of, um, you know, shifts into a different state of a different identity, but a lot of people have reported, you know, developing spiritual qualities, like, you know, an appreciation of solitude and quietness, Mm -hmm. an appreciation of simplicity. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you can make a parallel between the monastic life You know, the monastic life is all about quietness, simplicity, letting go of attachments to the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so in a way, it's a similar process to to what we've had to go through in, in the lockdown. You know, we've had to let go of attachments to the external world. We've had to embrace quietness. We've had to simplify our lives. We've had to spend more time in solitude. And those, you know, th- those situations can lead to spiritual exploration. Mm-hmm. And they can connect us to, you know, a, a spiritual essence within ourselves. Yeah, yeah. What are some of the 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 movement? Like, what 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 areas do you want to go further with this kind of exploration and research, Stephen? I'd like to do some more research on the phenomenon phenomenon of addiction release. You know, okay. um, going going back to the story I mentioned earlier about Eve, who mm-hmm. suddenly let go of her addiction, and I was I was really surprised at how common that was. You know, I spoke to six or seven addicts who'd experienced that phenomenon. You know, it, it was often just as simple as waking up in the morning and suddenly feeling that you were a different person, and suddenly feeling that your your craving for drugs had disappeared. So it's a it's quite a remarkable phenomenon. I think it can be explained in terms of a breakdown of identity. So, you know, when your old identity disappears, the addiction also disappears. And the new new identity which arises does not carry any addiction because it's completely new and fresh. You know, so so the addiction just just disappears with the old ego, if you like. So I'd like to do some more research in that area. And also, uh, I found so many cases of prisoners who'd undergone transformation, soldiers, Mm -hmm. And you know, situations like prison and warfare, they seem so paradoxical. You know, it seems so paradoxical that those situations can give rise to spiritual awakening. So I'd, I'd like to do more research on on soldiers and you know um, all the people who have who have spiritual awakenings or transformations in intensely stressful and, and, and brutal situations. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess. Understanding more of this this phenomenon maybe could lead to better care in the service of people's post traumatic growth. Yes, I mean, even if it just leads to more understanding, that will be helpful because, um, as we said earlier, a lot of people have problems because they don't understand what's happened to them and they can't accept what's happened to them. Partly because, as, as we just said, it's so uh, contrary to the the scientific physicalist view of the world. You know, a lot of people think that um, spiritual experiences are produced by aberrational brain activity and therefore they are kind of hallucinations, which is not true at all. So I think if there's more understanding and acceptance of these experiences, it will help people to integrate them Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it will stop people repressing them, which is also really important. Well, the the integration is, is I think, the big the big issue. Um, uh, When I was at APA a couple of years ago. And uh, sorry, I'm going to go back to our neurotran- neuromania, our neurotransmitter mania, <laughs> <laughs> serotoninergic, serotoninergic neuromania. Uh, Roland Griffiths and and the gang at Johns Hopkins doing the research at uh, on psilocybin and, and whatnot, all those those lovely serotoninergic drugs. Uh, they've done a lot of really wonderful work with it. Uh, it's it's a very in depth like 
15 session psychotherapy with a couple of the sessions of the psilocybin, medicalized dosage of it, taken out of its, its original cultural shamanic kind of experience of the mushroom. Uh, mm-hmm. but the, the take home for it in the Q and A was, this is all about like you're, you out there might, you know, how many people are, are going to be, how many of these labs are going to be out there? How many people have, can work in a psilocybin facilitating or otherwise lab? Uh, the experience has to be integrated afterwards. Uh, that's mm-hmm. the most important part of it. It's not the drug. It's the integration of this kind of shift. And it may well be that yeah. it's a serotonin, serotonergic, you know, uh, what, what are they calling it now? The uh, uh, default mode network of the brain is something that does shift uh, profoundly mm-hmm. with people with, with TTT experiences. We don't know. Kind of hard to measure that with unless you have, uh, you know, have it under a lab conditioning and and the wonderful thing about this is that people are capable of changing in in the twinkling of an eye right as saint paul would say which is kind of great but Mm. it's the i think it would be that integration part that's most important because it is so antithetical to the western physicalist kind of point of view Mm, Uh, that's true yeah i I mean I, i think it is changing to a degree I think there is more openness to unusual states of consciousness than there used to be 20 years ago. Oh, yeah. 20, years, 20 years ago was probably the peak of neuromania and <laughs> genoma, genome mania as well. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get enough. Oh, let's Those were the, days. the genes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. It's not the genes. It must be the neurons, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the physicalistic kind of thing behind it. Uh, you're right. Uh, I just got off the, uh, an interview with, with somebody on ayahuasca and tobacco and, and Native American, uh, and South American indigenous traditions. And, uh, he was saying the same thing. You know, it's like, uh, you can't mm-hmm. really, you can't really, uh, you have to integrate this somehow, especially with something like ayahuasca because it's just such a, a, a trickster of a plant and you can't really, yeah. you can't really, yeah. um, isolate one element from it because it's a concoction usually in conjunction with tobacco at some point you know so mm. that, which tobacco yeah. isn't like you know uh five five fives or paul malls or something it's a a very different experience uh and actually kind of a psycho psychedelic experience um yeah i think we're, we're moving into we're kind of shifting into a different paradigm that's going to be more accepting of these things. I hope at least. I hope so. I think it's partly because a lot of people sense that the materialist paradigm lies behind our present crises. It lies behind our, our environmental destruction because the materialist paradigm sees nature as a supply of resources. It sees nature as a machine, you know, and all living beings are essentially biological machines. So I think a lot of people are sensing that the, that the materialist paradigm leads to catastrophe. I think it ultimately does. And it, it creates a kind of cultural nihilism as well. It leads to consumerism. You could say that materialism as a paradigm leads to materialism, to materialism as a lifestyle. So people know yeah. that that's a dead end. It's becoming increasingly, increasingly clear that it doesn't lead to fulfillment. It yeah. creates destruction. So I think a lot of people are realizing that we need a new paradigm of reality. And also I think that reality, such as what you're, you're – um, um, explicating in your book, right? And this, this other half of things is spiritual awakening for people that can happen through trauma is uh, life happening in the face of uh, materialistic expectations. And it's, it, it is what it is. It, it, it happens. Spirituality happens. Mm, uh, anomalous. Mm. If, if you're an atheist or an agnostic, anomalous phenomena happen and they're real probably not replicable in a lab mm-hmm. yeah no yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean it would be it would be great to uh you know to get these people in the lab and to scan their brains when they have a spiritual awakening but you know you, you can't really catch them at the right moment uh, so. fmris are not pleasant spiritual experiences <laughs> unless you're no. into noisy machines that, that are i know and it, yeah. as i said before i don't think it matters i mean who cares what the brain activity yeah. is it yeah. doesn't yeah. It doesn't relate to people's experience, you know. So you're only, you're only trying to measure something. It doesn't capture the, the experience itself. Yeah, exactly. 
Well, uh, maybe maybe we. Could, if, do you have anything else you you wanted to to chat about today, or anything that you had on your mind? Uh, anything that's come up while we've been chatting? Um. Um. Only that. Um. You know. That I think it's helpful for people to realize that. Um, there is this transformational potential in negative events. I'm not saying that we should welcome negative events or seek them out. You know, we don't want to end up as Christian ascetics, like inflicting pain on ourselves. But, <laughs> but <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. But when negative events do occur, I think it's helpful for, to know that there is this potential, this transformational potential within them. And also, you know, they, they help us to realize that human beings are much more resilient than we normally give, give ourselves credit for. That was one of the um, the best things about doing the research for me was it, it made me me realize that you know when if crises do occur in my in my life at some point as they surely will there is resilience inside me there is re- resilience in everybody beyond you know beyond us you know what we suspect about ourselves and it always naturally arises in the face of negative events you know the deepest crises give rise to the deepest resilience yeah yeah excellent. Well, with that, maybe we should sign off. I'd love to have you back on the show at some point in time. Yeah, me too. It's been very enjoyable. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's been great. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. You too. Thanks for listening to the Psychology Talk podcast. Did you know that the Psychology Talk podcast has a Facebook page and an Instagram page? It's true. You can find more information about other guests and episodes, as well as more information about psychology and mental health. And if you liked this episode, go ahead and like us on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Stitcher, or Spotify and leave a review. It helps us grow our audience and provide more quality shows. All material, copyright the Psychology Talk podcast. This podcast is for informative and entertainment purposes only. If you need a mental health professional, please seek one out. Music is provided by the band Serenati.